Hi, it's Katrina. Number 10. Enki of Babylon The Atrahasis epic is the ancient story of a great flood sent by the many gods of Mesopotamia to destroy all of human life. It's very much like the other flood myths found in every religion since the dawn of time, but with a different twist. In the Babylonian version, it's the god Enki who warns a single good human, a man named Atrahasis, to build an ark. Written in the 17th century BC, the Atrahasis is believed to be based on a story that was much older, passed down from generations before. The Sumerian flood story was written in 2300 BC, and the Epic of Gilgamesh that also tells the story of a great flood is older than that. The Atrahasis begins when the world was created, but human beings didn't exist yet. The story goes that the elder ancient Mesopotamian gods would force the younger gods to do all of the work on Earth, like digging out the path for the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. They got tired and rebelled. So Enki, the young god of wisdom, convinced the rest of the gods to create something new to do the work instead. The gods then used their resources to create human beings, starting with seven men and seven women, who became the first humans on Earth. At first, the gods loved having these human servants, but they started to get annoyed because the humans were always causing problems. The most powerful god, Enlil, became angry and sent plagues and drought to make them suffer. Finally, the gods decide to send a flood to wipe them out. Enki feels bad for one of the humans, Atrahasis, and warns him. Atrahasis must gather two of every animal on his ark so that life on the planet can be saved. After the flood, the gods feel bad and regret what they have done. Enki proposes a new solution to the gods so that the humans stop causing so much trouble. There will now be more suffering. Demons will destroy infants and women will die giving birth. And so, the god of wisdom also brings about suffering to humankind. Number 9. Cernunos Cernunos, or Cernunus, is the name of an ancient Celtic god who represented all things in nature, from flora to fauna and even fertility. This is a little strange because most deities in the ancient world involved with fertility were female. Cernunus was an exception. He can be seen depicted in ancient artwork as a stag, wearing horns or antlers, and also as a cross between a deer and a bird. Valca Monica in Italy is home to one of the greatest collections of prehistoric petroglyphs covering a span of over 8,000 years. Here you can see representations of the magical god standing and wearing a long tunic. He holds a knife in his hand and wears antlers on his head. Images of him can be found everywhere in the Celtic world, including France, Denmark, Germany, Ireland, the list goes on. Sometimes he is sitting down, holding a knife and surrounded by snakes and oxen and wolves. Historians believe Cernunos may have been the inspiration for later depictions of the devil in Christian medieval literature, even though he represented nature and fertility. Nobody is entirely sure what this god's name means, although some have associated it with the Celtic word for horn. Because of that, he's considered the Celtic horned god, one of many horned gods in Celtic mythology. There are so many gods, monsters, and great beings in Celtic lore, and because they really didn't write much down, a huge portion of them have been lost. Number 8. The Anonymous God of Palmyra at the ancient site of Palmyra, located in modern Syria, archaeologists uncovered over 2,500 inscriptions in the Aramaic language. These texts date back to as early as the 2nd century AD and seem to suggest there was some kind of anonymous god worshipped by the people here. The biggest mystery for scientists has been trying to figure out who exactly the celestial deity was and what role they played in society. The thing that makes it so confusing is that the inscriptions refer to the deity as he whose name is blessed forever, lord of the universe, and other lofty titles. It was the Polish archaeologist Aleksandra Kubiak-Schneider who analyzed the inscriptions, which were found on stone altars in the ancient city where sacrifices had taken place. She said that for at least 100 years, the people of Palmyra worshipped a single deity that was the lord of the heavens and who had no name. One inscription said that the Great One came in the hour of trouble, made a miracle on the day of justice, dated 214 AD. Clearly, this was quite the benevolent being. So why didn't he have a name? 
Researchers believe it was actually taboo to say the name of the deity aloud, which is why he's considered anonymous. To understand where such a god came from, researchers had to look closer at the ancient city itself. Palmyra originally functioned as a caravan city until around the 1st century AD, when it became a huge metropolis from which trade came through Persia, India, and China. It was one of the richest cities around, a pearl in the desert. The people who lived here were from all parts of the world, and many of them were freed slaves. This means that many different religions were floating around at the same time. A kind of cult must have sprang up from all of these conflicting religious beliefs, and the people just kind of agreed to worship a single great entity. Either that, or they agreed to reference all the entities as Lord of the World and not say their names out loud. Number 7. Mictlantecutli Mictlantecutli was the Aztec deity of death, a terrifying figure from ancient Mexico that was normally portrayed with the face of a skull. Along with his wife, Mictecasihuatl, he ruled the underworld called Mictlan. He lived at the very bottom of this place, which similarly to the Christian version of hell, had nine levels. When a person died, they were forced to journey for four long years through horrible trials, all the way to the bottom of the nine levels of Mictlan to be able to be with their god. This is pretty unique in the world of forgotten religions because there was no paradise, purgatory, or perdition. There was only Mictlan, where all the souls of the dead went except for women who died during childbirth, people taken by storms, and those sacrificed. All the rest traveled to meet the Aztec god of death, who would either allow their soul to rest or make them disappear forever. Historians believe the Lord of the Dead was worshipped across the entire Mesoamerican world. Just like how so many gods in Mesopotamia came and went under different names, so too was Mictlantecutli represented in Mesoamerica. He was known as Yumsimil to the Maya, as Quero to the Zapotec, and as Tiwime to the Tarascan. Regardless of which particular culture was worshipping him, he was always the god of death and the underworld, symbolized by owls, spiders, and bats. Number 6. Kagutsuchi Kagutsuchi is known in Japan as the Shinto god of fire. He also goes by the name Homusubi and is the son of Isanami and Isanagi. For those not familiar with the Shinto religion, Isanami and Isanagi are the creator gods. These are the primordial beings who pulled the islands of Japan out of the sea and gave birth to the rest of the gods, known as Kami. Kagutsuchi fathered eight warrior gods, eight mountain gods, and several others. He was considered a destructive force to the Japanese, because to them, fire was one of the most dangerous elements. They typically made their houses and buildings from wood and paper instead of stone and mud like so many other cultures. Because of this, offerings needed to be made to Kagutsuchi frequently or else their houses would all burn down. The story of Kagutsuchi's birth is rather disturbing. He was so fiery hot that he killed his mother during birth, and his father was so angry that he chopped off his head. The blood that squirted from Kagutsuchi's neck gave birth to his first eight children and they all became powerful demigods and masters of martial arts. His father chopped the rest of his body up with his sword, and as more blood was shed, more children were born. In the Edo period between 1603 and 1868, the Japanese lived in mortal fear of this god. They performed massive ceremonies to ward him away, so that he wouldn't come and burn them in their sleep. And now for number 5. But first, I want to give a big shout out to Tyler Anderson and Andrea Treadway. Thanks so much for watching and supporting Origins Explained. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe and join the family. Number 5. Namu during the days of the first great kingdom of Sumer, they worshipped a large pantheon of gods. One of the most important was called Namu, the primeval mother goddess who not only created humanity, but gave birth to the gods themselves. She may have been the inspiration for Gaia, the figure of Mother Earth from Greek mythology. She was also later replaced by the Babylonian mother goddess Tiamat. Throughout just about every religion, up until people started worshipping a single god, there was always a mother goddess, and she was always responsible for the creation of pretty much everything. Unfortunately, Namu's story is a little vague, with her story changing over the centuries. We know she helped Enki to create humanity when the gods became too annoyed to do the work to build Earth. 
We also know she was likely the city patroness of Eridu before Enki replaced her. Namu's importance waned over time. The Babylonian counterpart, Tiamat, became far more popular as the mother goddess, and the creation story changed as well. By the time the Sumerians were gone, so too was the memory of Namu. Number 4. Luna Luna was, to the Romans, the daughter of Hyperion and Theia, and one of the most important figures in the original Roman pantheon. Her father, Hyperion, was the ruler of heavenly light and one of the twelve titan children of Gaia and Uranus. Theia was his sister, the goddess of sight whose brilliance was unparalleled. Luna was, in all likelihood, a personification of the moon. Her brother was Sol, the sun god, and her sister was Aurora, the goddess of the dawn. Luna was also the lady consort, at least one of them, of powerful Jupiter, god of sky, thunder, and king of all the standard Roman gods. He was essentially Zeus, since Roman and Greek mythology really did mirror each other in almost every way. The most interesting story involving Luna has to do with her and an astronomer named Endymion. He was also one of Jupiter's consorts, but Luna took a particular shine to him. As the goddess of the moon, she came to Endymion every night and gave him her protection, and they ended up having 50 offspring together called the Manae. These were representations of the 50 months of the four-year cycle based on the old Greek measurement of time. Number 3. Moloch out of all of the old Canaanite gods, Moloch was by far the worst and the most terrifying. He was described in the Old Testament as a great and terrible god associated with human sacrifice. He is mentioned only briefly and in the most vague way possible, with no information of where exactly he came from. In fact, Moloch is quite a mystery. We know he wasn't worshipped by the Israelites because they never practiced the ritual of sacrificing humans to appease gods. That means that Moloch goes back much further in time, at least to the Phoenicians. Unfortunately, the true extent of Moloch's horror is not historically known. We've seen him all over the ancient world depicted as either a bull, an ox, or even a minotaur. He may have been the Ammonite god Milcom, or he could have been the god Baal from old Mesopotamia. Whatever the case, cults of worshippers praise Moloch as they practice human sacrifice, quite often with children. In every story and in every mythology, regardless of what name he goes by, Moloch is always represented as some kind of bull, and he's always in need of child sacrifice victims. There are some unconfirmed stories that the cultists used to fashion metal bulls with empty stomachs, then put children inside the bulls and roast them alive. Number 2. Lord Varuna Lord Varuna is one of the oldest and most important Vedic deities from ancient India. There are four Vedas, all-knowing gods who represent the heavens, the earth, the air, and the water. These gods are always there, always listening, and all-powerful. For example, the ancient Vedic texts speak of Lord Varuna as someone who encompasses the entire world, and for that he's worshipped as the personification of the sky. He is also believed to be the one who controls all bodies of water, and so he's the god of the ocean too. He has 1,000 eyes so that he can see everything that's happening in the world at the same time, and he's normally spotted flying around on a chariot pulled by seven beautiful swans. However, there are also depictions of Lord Varuna as a man adorned in golden armor and sitting on the back of a Makara, an ancient sea monster. To this very day, Hindus continue to worship Lord Varuna. Most people consider him the sea god, and it's customary to offer him a coconut on the Raksha Bandhan day. He plays a role in many important rituals, because after all, who wants to anger the sea and the sky? Number 1. Chaos Before there was a pantheon of gods in Greek mythology, there was nothing. The world was a dark void. And then there was chaos. Chaos emerged at the dawn of creation from the darkness. Chaos was often represented as a female entity, a primordial force of mass and energy. She was the beginning of everything, an endless twisting darkness of creation and potential. Chaos was also the atmosphere around the earth, the invisible air and the fog and the mist. It was from chaos that the three primordial gods were born. She gave birth to Gaia, the earth, Tartarus, the underworld, and Eros, love. Some Greeks then referred to chaos as male, a god of fate that was self-created. 
Chaos would go on to bear two more gods, Erebus, the darkness, and Nyx, the night. Greek writers and philosophers would go on to define chaos as the mix of elements that existed in the universe. Chaos has no father or mother or creator and knows everything that happens in the universe and beyond. Thanks for watching. Which mysterious god or goddess is your favorite? Let me know in the comments below and be sure to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. See you soon. Bye.